and welcome everyone to the third reading session on this channel. Thanks for everyone who came and visited the podcast. For everyone who subscribed to this channel. It's nice to see that in just a few days, we had over 250, 200 views. It's good to see that people want to have this kind of conversation and this long-term conversations that I'm trying to have with different people. I was obviously not thinking that it would even cross 100 views, but it's good that it has crossed 200. And I hope all of you who has helped me so far will share this video to the friends and help us have these conversations in the future. So welcome to the third reading session on this channel. This essay was a reply to my first guest, Franzka, and she wrote her theory of essence. Theory of essence was about human and nature symbiosis and the connection that we have with the planet, with the place that we are living in. In a time when it is even more difficult to talk about issues like spirituality, mysticism, finding self-awareness in a really distant world, in a really distanced world, I think it is good to have these kinds of discussions which help us contemplate on who we are and which help us grow in the process. So the essay is titled On Life, Death and Beyond. To give you a bit of a background about this essay, I wrote this essay and while writing this essay, the thoughts that I had in my mind were presumably more leaning towards Indian philosophy because this is the time when I had come back to India and I had got deep into the Indian literature, the Indian philosophy, primarily Hinduism and Buddhism and understanding the metaphysical and psychological background on the text that I was reading, I decided that I should give more weight to these literatures. So without further ado, we'll start the reading session. On life, death, and beyond. Death. Death is an idea which constricts our thinking brain. It puts it into a box, or maybe suggests us a possibility that there exists an entry point, that is birth, and an exit point, that is death. Why is this? This is due to the hundreds of years of psychological transformation of the brain by religion, politics, all kinds of institutions that prey upon this idea. And to be frank, this is how cultures and economies operate in every country. There is a great deal of money involved in death in the Western countries, similarly in the Eastern traditions. The idea of opening the door of death can be found in the teachings of Buddha, who by saying sorrow and pain exists and we need to accept it, puts a case 
that a psychological transformation of the mind is what is needed to go beyond death. For this teaching is psychological in nature and Hindu teachings are metaphysical in nature. Yet they both point towards one thing, that is transformation. One of the mind, another of the body, as well as habit. Drawing parallels between the elements of life and human nature is necessary. As we are a byproduct of a nature that is evolving in stages. There are stages when the elements are stable, and there are long periods of time where persistently nothing happens. Yet, when this disbalance in nature arises, we see a big transformation in human life as well. For example, the Black Death killed almost a number of people, most of the population in Europe in the 13th century, which then resulted into an exponential growth in the 14th and 15th century, which we now call Renaissance. The Great Plague of London in the 16th and 17th century resulted into the Industrial Revolution in the 17th and 18th century. So this imbalance caused by nature is an integral part which precedes our human progression. Hence the fear of death is a great motivator to life itself. Funnily, I had a plaque on my wall in Cheltenham which said, too many emotions drag you away from reality. So I completely agree with the fact that too much empathy is problematic in the progression of life and drags you away from what people call the essence, now, Tao. It presupposes that the past and future implications of the given situation are as it is and does not look at it as a situation that ends then and there in the moment. Conceptualization is limited to the bricks of existence. I'd like to add that conceptualization itself comes from the Greek rationality. Hence, it does not go beyond the limitation of words. We can feel it, but we cannot describe it. We can sense it, yet we cannot express it. We give it too many names, yet names are only words created by man to try to put it in words. I believe that we are the creator and created, manifested in one body. The observer and the observer, the observer and the observed both reside within our own cognitive abilities to form this world for itself. We are all on a search to come to a conclusion that the God or whatever we want to call it, that we are trying to find is us. You are actually God living a human life. And yet, God is just a word. I think the primary reason why we are lost is because this world runs on conditioning. A basic operating system in which everyone puts themselves and keeps marching forward from there on, regardless. What we see today around us and what is happening is the future showing itself. 
never in the human past existed a point where we could peek into humanity's future. All the things have already happened and we are only witnessing it now. We blind ourselves in the process of learning the ways of the world in our childhood. We forget the intuitive nature that is passed on to us through our DNA. I give the analogy of my dog. He was bred in a human family for a year since its birth, but it knows all the acts that it is supposed to do as a dog. Although he never encountered an actual dog until he was a year old. It is similar to us humans. We both, we would be much better off and one with the world, with the nature, without all this conditioning. Well, why do I keep pointing towards the Vedas, towards Upanishads? These are all ancient Hindu philosophies. There is a word called Tattva. This does not translate to philosophy, although it is done that way. Tattva means the reality, it means truth. I believe the Egyptians, the Greeks, Christians were talking about human history through mythology. But this is where the thought of Upanishads break the course of writing down histories. It only talks of the truth and nothing about histories. I believe everyone on this planet needs to learn and understand the Upanishads as deeply as they can to understand their own true nature. Everyone is on a different path. We all are not same. We have to look towards the East, towards the research that is going on in different fields. This is the only way to get out of this man-made disaster. There is a saying in the Upanishads, Jitendriyam Dhimatam Varishtam. Only the one who has conquered his senses is intelligent among all supreme beings. Well, if we are a thought, in the end, we keep living on forever. From one person to the other, our thoughts are made up of many thoughts preceding us, which means all of them are still living through us. The idea of reincarnation in my belief is such. Now, I'll tell you what the Hindus thought of this idea. They gave the word Paramatman or Ishwar. These words suggest to self. None of it suggests God. So in the longer Hindu texts, Mahabharat, Ramayana, and all other texts, the writers have said that Ishwar has to take many forms to come down on earth, which means all the roles that we play in our daily life. You're not a single person. You're fragments of your own self and you play a different role in front of a different friend or in front of your family or your parents. Rebirth in those terms means each new day in your life when you have a clean slate to start again and to work on your mistakes. Let's talk about time now. Time is a very Western concept. In many tribes and Eastern traditions, 
time works in a different way. We have kal, i.e. yesterday, aaj, i.e. today, and kal, i.e. tomorrow. You will realize that the word for yesterday and tomorrow is the same. I'm always curious as to why the language was designed in such a way that time had a symbolic importance and why an eternal now was created in the language itself. Anyhow, we don't come back in the same physical shape, in the same physical form, but we come back in thought. Hence, death can never exist. Now, we say, I die. But we cannot say, we cannot forget that even though that I, that you call yourself, was created from your childhood, our knowledge about that I in us comes from others who are similarly conditioned to think that the I, that me, in them. So if there is no I, there only exists a physical form that is created and it perishes to create again. A human being is much more than what the world makes of it. Well, the world won't go on forever. Even though life has moved on, it has moved on away from humans to artificial intelligence. This is just one reality among many others. And all of us, we will come back to experience a different one. You choose how to view this world. Take some extreme steps if need be, because the only control that you will have is not on the outside events, but on your own experience of this that is now. This essay, I wrote it after having some profound, after going through some profound journeys. And all of them were after being induced in a meditative state for long periods of time. And I want to say for all of you who think that you're young or too young to think of something like this. I want to say that this is the best opportunity, the best time that you have of which you can give yourself. And to contemplate on your life right now is extremely important if we want to continue as human beings. You can do that job that you want to do, which is not paying you enough right now, but only because your phone, your laptop, the TV, someone on Netflix, or some advertisement, someone is coming up to you and saying, Keep working hard and you'll reach the goal. Well, it's not necessary to be extremely rich. That's not the goal in life. The only goal in life could be understanding your true nature, understanding who you are, 
having what is sufficient for you and living a good life. So with that, this was the third reading session of an essay that I wrote as a reply to my, third, my first guest, Franska Hussman. I think you should read the theory of essence as well, because it's absolutely in interesting just to read on its own. And it gives a different perspective on life, on nature, on the world that we are living in. And it gives a much more feminine side of what the world can be. So a link, a website, and you can go and read the theory of essence for yourself. And you can find my website in the description and you can go and check out the essays that I have written so far. And I'm also a photographer. So you can go onto the store at ashutoshyoshi.in and check out the work that I have over there and try buying a few prints so from there if you like. And help me sustain this channel by helping me through PayPal. I'll have a description in the link below. But keep coming back to this channel and keep hitting the subscriber button and liking this video and sharing it with people who will like to have open-minded discussions about the topics that we are discussing. So with that in mind, thank you all for coming and I'll see you in the next one.